But we started the brand seven years ago. We came to the conclusion, we're going to be kids of immigrants. We we're kids of immigrants yesterday. We we're kids of immigrants today. And we'll be kids of immigrants tomorrow. And we knew that that wouldn't change. So although this brand could evolve, that would be a constant. Have you ever noticed that some of the best ideas come from unexpected places? Your next breakthrough may come from a leader facing similar challenges, but in a completely different sector. Welcome to Chief Influencer. I'm your host, Anthony Shop. Join us as we explore how today's successful leaders inspire, influence, and connect with others. Chief Influencer is a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board, who have teamed up to spotlight how great leaders and communicators are making their impact in the world. This episode is brought to you by the George Washington University's College of Professional Studies. With in-person and online programs, ranging from master's degrees in public relations strategy to certificate programs in digital communications, GW offers more than just the credentials to help working professionals get ahead. It prepares them to be leaders in their field. As a proud GW graduate myself, I can attest that faculty members combine academic rigor with real-world lessons that can't always be found in textbooks. Check out cps.gwu.edu for more information. I am so excited to introduce today's guest, Daniel Buezo, founder of Kids of Immigrants, a Los Angeles-based, purpose-driven streetwear brand that People Magazine called a cult favorite, and which has had collabs with some of the world's top brands. I'm talking Apple, Nike, Vans, Bad Bunny, and many, many more. Daniel and his best friend, Wella Dennis, created Kids of Immigrants as a medium to express their passion to create, empower, and love. Inspired by their roots, environments, and life experiences, the mission statement is simple. Do the best we can with what we have. Both Buezo and Dennis are first-generation Americans and established the name from what united them and makes this country. We are all immigrants. Kids of Immigrants is a movement to recognize that we are all cut from different fabrics but together make a whole. Here's what the LA Times had to say about kids of immigrants. For these founders, wholesomeness reigns supreme. Their clothing dedicates itself to things like love, friendship, family, and empowerment in a way that feels almost rebellious in a world that rewards hype. It has captivated a fan base that aspires to some kind of deeper meaning too. After all, how many times have you seen someone wearing a t-shirt or carrying a tote bag with one of kids of immigrants instantly recognizable slogans, support your friends, love has no limits, anything is possible, and thought to yourself, I want that for me. So Daniel, we are thrilled that you could join us today. Welcome to Chief Influencer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here too. You once said about Kids of Immigrants, we came out of the gate understanding how fashion can separate all of us. So we wanted to make something that didn't do that, but instead brought us all together. I just, that's really powerful, I think. And I wonder if you could talk about how Kids of Immigrants came to be and the impact that you wanted to make in the world. Yeah, I mean, that's, these are things that we said now seven plus years ago. And it's amazing to still you know, stick to our guns and and stick to our values and say, hey, this is this is what we want to represent. Um, early on, you know, my background being in retail uh, and I went to school for social work. Um, I think fashion, just in general, and streetwear. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm a big part of it. I think overall, like I don't necessarily shame the direction of fashion streetwear. Um, or style. Well, style is, a, is more of what we wanted to do. Um, I just felt that, you know, in a lot of ways, it also separated us as far as like, you know, being, you know, if you wear certain things or if you can access certain um, things in fashion, you might feel better or more exclusive and I think in a world where u- unity is needed more and more, like we figure that if we can bring that energy um, into streetwear, 
we can really like uh, start something that feels good, just something that people can wear that not only looks good and has the taste level, but also make them feel good. Um, and yeah, so I mean, early on, you, to what you're saying, that those are like things that we said so long ago that I almost forget that we said because it has evolved so much. But yeah, that those were like those beginning thoughts that we were like, it, it needs to be more than just hype and access and sort of ego driven, you know? You know, I read um, that Ralph Lauren was an early influence on you. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and what that brand meant to you being a first generation American and how that inspired the type of brand that you wanted to build and how that's maybe different in some ways from um, yeah, what you experienced with that brand. Yeah, I mean, Ralph, Ralph is the man, you know, I think from what he created um, that is beyond him as a person now, um, the lifestyle of it. And just how he was able to expand into so many different verticals and really create the American heritage brand that and the standard for American fashion in a lot of ways. Um, growing up in New York, you know, polo, you know, the, the what they call the low life, you know, for for shortened for polo, like that was part of fashion for us that was part that was early on streetwear days of Tommy Hilfiger and Nautica and these American heritage brands that we loved growing up and still love to this day um but I think at a certain point I realized that this is not the America that I know you know this is not fully representing who I am um and if anything has a very small influence of you know, from who I am as a kid of a, of a, of parents from Honduras. Um, so I, my ongoing saying is like, I wore polo my whole life, you know, a man with a horse on my t-shirt or polo shirt or whatever, and never been on a horse to this day. And, you know, I think that those little like, you know, moments that you're like, wait, this this doesn't represent me, but I still wear it every single day and until still wear polo today. But I, I think that was an opportunity for for me and, and for us to say, well, what is our story um, and what how does that translate into apparel and fashion and streetwear? And and you and your co-founder said, you know, Ralph Lauren, he had to that's not the name he was born with. He had to sort of adopt a new identity to make it in America. And um, your brand is about how you don't have to create a new identity, right? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, Ralph, Ralph's whole story. And, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a new era now and it's a new world that we're living in. More, more specifically, the youth isn't budging and they are very knowledgeable and very well informed of like, you know, things that, you know, uh, for me growing up, we didn't know any better or we just, you know, we knew what we knew. And um, for us, it's, it's amazing to have, you know, to stick to who we are and not change that. And then, you know, in return, inspire so many others and build and cultivate a community that's like we we're with you we're also going to stick by who we are as well and and do this together your your brand has resonated with so many people since you started can you take us back and talk a little bit about maybe your breakout moments yeah, I mean, there's so many, um, especially early on, because, you know, I, I try to s stick with that same level of gratitude early on, because, you know, any little thing, our first few years was so big and so important. But I think, you know, for me, I met Wella 10 years ago, we started the brand seven years ago, when we one thing we came into the conclusion with was like, we're going to be kids of immigrants 
We were kids of immigrants yesterday. We're kids of immigrants today and we'll be kids of immigrants tomorrow. And we knew that that wouldn't change. So although this brand could evolve, that 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 would be a constant. Um, so and I think that that aff affirmative feeling also came from our surroundings. So early on, it was for me, it was enough just getting the support from my close friends and family and them to like, you know, empower me to say, yeah, like this is great. Um, the first big breakthrough was, you know, I know Kehlani, uh, the music, the musician, the artist for a long time. Um, and I just remember her like hitting me up and was like, I want to fully support this. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what brand awareness or exposure or marketing was. Like I, I knew if an artist or influencer wore your, your items, it, it's a great, it's great, but that wasn't really the beginning intentions of it. I think with streetwear and fashion, that's that sometimes becomes such a big focus that you lose, you know, your intention and your purpose of it. So when we were started receiving like inquiries from like artists like a Kehlani, that was huge because I never reached out to her like, hey, I want you to wear this. Um, and I remember the the first big breakthrough was she wore the original Support Your Friends shirt at Lollapalooza festival that she was playing. And it was just a huge message to the crowd. It was a huge message to the world. And everyone's like, what shirt is that? Um, and that's when we're like, okay, people want this. People are resonating. People are feeling this. Um, I think after that, we, um, because I have some background in working in the music industry, we're able to work with a lot of different uh artists um i know you mentioned early on bad bunny we we didn't ever collab with bad bunny but because of his stylist the relationship i had with his stylist his stylist hit me up and was like yo bad bunny's on tour we'll love to grab some stuff and and you know fortunate for us and you know I, i'm gonna call it alignment somebody else is gonna call it luck but for for me you know bad bunny you know, won his Latin Grammys and he's wearing Kids of Immigrants. And it's such a huge moment for him as an artist. Um, and then they, he's just randomly wearing it. Um, and those are like just some big moments that at that time, more than just like the excitement of it, it was just very, the, those moments brought a lot of affirmations to like, you know, at that time being in my 20s, it's like, what am I doing? I don't know what's like, who knows, is this working? Am I crazy? Um, but those, more than anything, I feel like all those early moments um, were just big affirmations to what we we're doing. Um, and then working with some of the nonprofits that we work with, with within those first few years and how, you know, how, how we were able to be impactful so early on, uh, those moments also gave me uh, a sense of just purpose. And I think, you know, when you find that, you know, and you feel that it, it, it keeps you motivated and going. Daniel, you know, every time I talk to you, your, your humility really comes through when we, when we think about um, support your friends, you know, it occurs to me that first there's a lot of, you know, negativity in the world and you um, emerged with this message that was sort of counter to that, that really, you know, resonated with people. But the other thing is we all know that there are viral moments and things that just sort of pop up and vanish and support your friends and kids of immigrants is obviously much more than that. You've really um, been able to build. What do you think you and your team did to take, you know, something that that um, emerged like the support your friends that Kehlani wore, but but 
to continue to expand the brand and build and do so much more over the last seven plus years? Uh, I feel like for us, it's just honest. It's, it's our life. Um, I I can vouch for my team and myself that, you know, we're not perfect beings, but I, I, I think one thing I believe in myself and, and, and the people who surround me and the team is just their intention. And, um, we truly mean what we're saying. Um, and early on for us, we didn't have funding. We didn't have, we were limited with resources and tools and et cetera. But what we did have was our friends and our community, um, first year of the company, first few years of the company, like my friends would just show up and whether it was the photographer, whether it was the models, where it was the website developer, where whether it was just friends that wanted to help me um, in my journey. It was nothing in return that they wanted in return outside of like supporting me and uh, the genuine support that we received. So uh, when support your friends, we didn't, uh, a quick backstory on support your friends. Early on in the company, we didn't do any printables or we didn't have any cash flow to like actually go into production. Well, it made everything from scraps. So support your friends. The first year of the brand, we really, everything that we sold was um, upcycled from thrift stores. So we go to thrift stores, buy a few, you know, buy items for a few dollars. And then what we would say is like, we'll remaster them. Um, support your friends is a collage of three shirts. Uh, one shirt that says support yours. Another shirt that had the friends in the arch. Well, it collapsed cut those two pieces from a shirt and put it on the third shirt. So that that for me, again, some people will call it just luck or whatever. I call it just divine and alignment. Like this quote wasn't, we didn't come up with like support your friends. This is, this is the direction of the brand. We we're going to, this is how we're going to market ourselves. None of that was in place. Um, this was just him genuinely creating something from his heart. Um, and then when we saw it, honestly, I'm gonna I'm be honest. I liked the shirt. I thought it was it was great, but I didn't think of that being the shirt that will level us up and that would resonate with the entire world. And it was only one shirt, and but the shirt hit so hard, and it was so honest to us, and then to all of our friends. Like when they looked at us, and when we looked at them, we knew that this shirt was more than just in a design, it was a lifestyle for us. And and I I strive to keep that level of honesty in what we say and who we are. I, that is just an incredible story. And that, you, you know, you mentioned it's kind of like almost divine, you know, the way that it all came together. Um, when you think about that ethos of what you're all about, um, can you talk about the booth that you had at Complex Con. And I think that's just such a perfect example of what your brand stands for. And I mean, talk about support your friends. Yeah. Can you maybe share that? Um, so I'm a little bit crazy and you know, I'm, I'm sometimes my business decisions aren't business, uh aren't business smart decisions. Um, well, they work, seem to be working out. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Complex Con uh, offered us a space, um, we were at very honored. But, you know, I've been to multiple Complex Cons every year. You know, it's the biggest streetwear moment in the world, of, you know, once a year. Um, so when they offered us uh, the space, you know, we... We knew that we can make a great collection. We can put some marketing behind it and sell it at Complex Con. That's, you know, that's what everyone wants to do at Complex Con for the most part. Um, but I knew for me, it was just like, this is a moment where we are on stage with our peers or with, you know, brands that are in the same industry as us. And we are we understand that we 
what we're different at. And, you know, as we're inspired by them, we know why they're inspired by us. So this was a moment to be on stage, the biggest stage of streetwear, and make that statement of who we truly are. And when I first said this to the team and to Complex, I was like, we're going to do the booth. We're going to bring all our friends in and we're going to, uh, you know, give them our platform to showcase their brands. And we're not going to sell. We're not going to sell anything. Um, and I was like, what? Wait, um, as anyone may know, just just in, in a, any type of convention, whether it's Complex Con or all other conventions there are in this world, this costs a lot of money to do. This is not any. So, you know, business wise, you're thinking of how you're going to recoup, how you're going to, you know. But for me, I knew this was an investment. I was like, this is an investment in our community. This is an investment in our values and what we believe in. And I don't want anyone to mix the message up. I don't want, I want it to be very clear that we mean this, what this shirt says, we mean it with our heart. Um, so we invited our friends, 13 brands total, to come to 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 come to our uh booth and be part of this story of support your friends. Um, we, you know, Susu and Debbie, you know, uh, Debbie's our creative director and community uh, lead and in, in marketing. Uh, Susu is our experimental producer and, and so much more. They, they both are, you know, the backbone to these events. Um, but you know, they produced and designed this this booth and, you know, very, very, some very, that was a very tough week or weeks of work. Um, and we, we made it and we literally brought in these 13 brands up and coming and, and, you know, gave them an, op gave them an opportunity that I would have wished for at that, uh, stage of my company at that age, um, and it was the most rewardful thing that one of the most rewardful things that we've done as a brand and as individuals um, to see the the joy and the success that we had, you know, success for us was is what led us to the when the community wins, we win. And when we win, the community wins. Um, and I, I remember we spent a lot of money on this and two weeks before Again, some more divine moments. Uh, UPS came in and said uh, they they were partnering with someone else. It didn't work out. And they asked, can they be a part of our booth? So two weeks before the event, they came in as partners and, and basically offset the cost for us, um, which was amazing because we were, we were a lot, you know, a significant amount of money in. Um, and not only did they offset the entire cost for us, but they also um, gave each brand a $5,000 grant. Um, so it was an incredible weekend. And when I say I, we, it was the, one of the most rewarding moments is because what that created for us. And I think the level of inspiration is served for so many others. Um in this world of business and streetwear that we can still all win together and we can all eat together, um, I think was, was priceless. It's such a great story in so many ways. And, you know, it occurs to me shows like the power that a brand can have that support your friends was, um, almost accidental. It wasn't what you expected at the beginning to be sort of your core message, even though it obviously was part of your culture. And then you leaned into it and you're like, this is, this is who we are. This is what we're about. And then you did that. And I think even the visuals for those who have seen the pictures, maybe you can describe sort of the, uh, what you call it? Potluck style, sort of that visual aesthetic that you had at the yeah. complex con event. Yeah, we we were just like, yeah, this is a big family event. So it's like potluck style. Everybody bring their own dish, aka 
their apparel, their line, whatever that was. And we can all coexist the way in a like potluck style, you know, uh, everyone brings their favorite dish that, I don't know, a recipe from their mom or, you know, whoever it was, and we can coexist in this space and have fun. And I think when I think, when I, when I think of the KOI vibe, we always think of family gatherings and um, cookout, you know, uh, style things. So that was the idea. We also thought that that idea was going to be the least cost efficient. Um, it still costs so much money. But anyhow, we were like, it'll be easy. We just got to grab some chairs and make it look like, you know, everyone, we got cookout stuff at home. We could bring it in. Um, but you know, those events just, it, it, it takes a, a, a great load of money to like yeah. make, to execute, but we still did it. And, uh, and then we, we, we just wanted to put powerful messages around the entire booth. So it's like anything is possible, uh, unity within the community, uh, unity within the community creates opportunity, support your friends, spread love. Um, so having those things surrounding, you know, as the exterior of it and then the interior with potluck style with flags everywhere, we, we love to like represent, um, our brand through all the, as many, fla- you know, representing all flags, all people, um, in one place. Yeah. And literally like metal trays of what could be, you know, mac and cheese or, mm-hmm. you know, rice or whatever that have. Yeah t-shirts and merchandise from all of these brands that you invited to be part of your your fashion potluck your streetwear potluck i think it's it's um you know pretty cool and and i imagine was a huge contrast to maybe a lot of the other booths and displays so it really you know connected with people in a visceral way that family kind of potluck style um <laughs> the, yeah. the other thing I wanted to kind of ask about with this is, you know, you all kids of immigrants have built partnerships with literally the top brands that have ever existed, right? Apple, Nike, Meta, UPS. And I want to know how you can balance who you are and the vision and the values that you had when you started KOI with Wella with what these you know, publicly traded companies with shareholders want from you? Because obviously there's a reason that they want to partner with you and with KOI. And, you know, it occurs to me with the complex con example, I mean, you didn't build something that a partner wanted for them. You built what was authentic for you and then you attracted a partner. But you know, that must be a tension. And I know it's a tension that a lot of business leaders face when they're trying to build partnerships. So can you talk about that for us? Yeah, I mean, being completely transparent, we've, you know, things have go- have been great and things have also been great learning lessons for us. Um, it's good there, framing. There's been a lot of times that we, you know, we stuck to what we believe we wanted to do and had partners support it. And there's been times that I specifically myself as the CEO of the company, you know, did something that I was like, I'm not proud of that. Um, and but those moments I wasn't proud of are it's what made me better and made me sharper. Um, and I think for You know, there's a lot of reasons as to why maybe I took on an opportunity that I wasn't fully proud of. Um, I I think as kids of immigrants, as myself, a kid from the hood, from New York, um, a kid that never imagined what the opportunities that I have on hand now, um, it's hard to say no. And part of what you're saying and being very uh, sharp with the vision and sticking to what you believe in and not allowing these huge partnerships or these budgets to steer that away is learning how to say no. And it's hard to say no 
when you never had these opportunities. It's hard to say no when maybe you didn't have the mentorship. It's hard to say no when you have bills to pay. Um, but we've been, I've learned from those moments. Um, and those moments have made me better in, in um, just fully seeing it out and believing in, in ourselves enough to say no and believing in our value enough to say that's not enough. Um, and that takes practice. I think it, it wasn't, you know, who I was just six months ago, you know, so forget a year ago, it's not the same person I am today. And, you know, the practice and the the learning process of it is never ending. So it, it's been, it's, it's really hard. It's really challenging. Again, I think, you know, coming from not having anything to having opportunities, it's hard to say no to opportunities, but I've learned that saying no is what brought the best opportunities to us. That is such a powerful lesson that I think anyone, <laughs> whether whatever <laughs> type of leader or professional or family, I mean, you know, that that lesson about saying no, and it sounds like you constantly go back to your values and your mission that you started with as a way to determine when to say no or how to say yes. Yeah. I think we we have like internally, we always have this moment of clarity when, you know, now we're better than ever with it, but every time we get a great opportunity and there's a budget and there's a great partner and it's like, we start getting very creative and we're like, let's, let's open up a nonprofit in LA and do it like this and do it like that. And which are all great ideas and truly like things that we, we ask ourselves, like, how are we going to help our community with this? How are we helping with this? Um, and those things just go everywhere. Um, I, I always say we can help, we we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And we can help, we we can't help everyone, but we can help someone. Mm-hmm. And I think we go back to those values every single time. And it's like, because we start getting inspired and then we can't come to an exact idea because there's so many and we and we end up every single time we end up going to like, who are we? What are we at heart? Not thinking of the partner not thinking of the possibilities of this evolving into this whole other thing. We still, you know, want to be, have a vision, but we can't let that vision deter from what our true values and tr- true core is, um, and we always just go back to it every single time, like especially every time that we start feeling stagnant or just creative roadblocks. We're like, wait, wait, we're thinking way too much. The answer should be right in front of us. We just got to calm down. We got to focus. We got to go back to who we are and then move forward. OK, there's so many things I want to ask you, but from what you just said there at the end, I want to kind of jump to something you talked about. Calm down and focus. And one of the things I've heard you talk about is um, the the importance of taking time for yourself as a leader. I mean, I know you connect with communities, you connect with partners, but once I heard you talk about the most important meeting you have every day, can you tell everybody a bit about your practice? I say the most important meeting you have with, I tell myself that because I, as you know, I'll have 10 meetings a day. So I, and I always tell myself the most important meeting I, I'm going to have is with myself. And by my, when I mean myself, I mean my inner self and um, that the, the, you know, the most high, the, 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 I believe that the innermost is the highest most. Um, and whatever that translate to, whoever, you know, um, I don't judge that. It's like, for me, I believe in this, you know, this power that's beyond me. So 
that's where I asked the, the the most important questions. It's like um, we just did this Nike partnership um, in the spring, and we had so many ideas, and I was going crazy because I was like, "Damn, all these ide- ideas are good." I became very indecisive, um, became very eager, a bit anxious, and I just remember telling the team, "I need a week. I need a week to ask myself." to ask God, to ask life, what do we need to say? What do we need to tell the world? Um, So I have to just cut the distractions, cut the noise and go within. And I I strongly believe that we all have the answers that we're looking for in those moments of silence. And silence is so powerful. Um, But, you know, I'm also, you know, a workaholic. You know, I'll work from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. Um, But I know that I've learned that productivity um, and being inspired to do something that's beyond you are two separate things. Like I I learned that I can't go to the office to be inspired. Don't get me wrong. There's inspiration there. But to be inspired, I need to just be calm. I need to. I find inspiration in doing nothing and sitting still. So, you know, when I'm at the office, we're constantly productive. We have deadlines, we have things we have to do. And um, so the more we have grown, the more I have grown, the more time that I have to set aside for myself. And that is hard. It's difficult because the more we grow, the more work we have to do. And then I have to also counterbalance that with like time alone. Um, And it's almost like, I think the mind tricks me because of productivity results, tricks me into like that time alone, that time meditating, that time praying, that time writing, whatever it is you do to have that alone time um, is not productive and you, you need to go to the office, you need to take calls, um, but it is the complete opposite. And even though I know that really well, I still trick myself into believing that I need to spend less time alone and more time being productive, <laughs> so. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is a daily practice for you, right? You yeah. try to meditate or pray or spend that time in silence every day. Can you, when did this start? I mean, I think that this is obviously a really important part of your um, leadership style, your ability to focus and to prioritize and to channel creativity. Um, When did you discover that this was such an important part of who you were? I think I always, you know, I grew up in church. My parents were uh, Christian. And so there was always this, uh, you know, this knowledge of it. And I think you know, as I got older, I not, you know, I was like, some of these things don't fully align with me. Um, but I knew that there was still something there that's been guiding me. Um, and I knew that also that didn't, didn't depend on an exact religion or, you know, I think we all, what we say now is more, you know, we're I'm more spiritual than religious, right? Um, so I knew there was something, um, a truth there. Um, and in year two and three, although these years are still very challenging and still like kick my butt, um, year, year two and three, I develop a crazy uh, in, uh, like anxiety. Year one, without year one, you 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 know everything is a win, and there's no reference, there's no ly to it. So year two and three, I just wanted to be better than year one. And when it didn't feel that way and when the results weren't that way, I was just like freaking out. And I didn't even know what anxiety was my whole life. I had little to no awareness of mental health. Um, It's not, you know, again, as kids of immigrants, I always say there's so many great things that our parents did for us and then embedded in us. But there's a lot of negligence, too, that I just like I have no clue about that. Also, I inherited it. So anxiety was never, 
you know, something for me. Like I, I, I thought that's just, you know, people just making excuses. Um, and it hit me really hard. And um, I learned, I, I started reading books on meditation. I started listening to uh, Michael Beckwith, which is like a spiritual leader, um, and just started learning how to meditate. And it's the hard, it's one of the hardest things to do is to silence the mind. Thousands and thousands of thoughts and you're stopping it like, wait, and then just gaining awareness of it. Like, okay, I see, I see my mind racing. Um, and it started calming my anxiety, but also giving me a lot of clarity of who I am. I started therapy about over a year ago to learn how much more anxiety, anxious, I'm an anxious person. Um, I've learned the good things of anxiety for me. Like, I have to get it done because if not, I'm anxious about it. But I also learned how anxiety had its negative impacts on me and how it's kept me, you know, I, you know, what that feeling was when I'm just concerned about some future moments. Um, so I think the anxiety still exists to this day. I felt anxious this whole week because I'm traveling and I'm thinking of work back home, et cetera. But I know that with a good night's sleep and a good meditation and some good reading and some good alone time, I'm back on track. So I think talking to my therapist uh, a few months back, it's been a minute. Um, and I told him, you know, the anxiety is like reaching these peak, new peak moments for me. Um, and he was like, well, have you been exercising? Have you been meditating? Have you been sleeping well? And it's like, oh, I know, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if my anxiety will ever completely be healed, but I have great awareness of it through meditation, through, you know, taking inventory of my thoughts, um, and also knowing what, what sets me up to have a good day and making sure that I stay on routine to those things. Um, so yeah, long, long answer, but yeah, meditation has literally saved me and my life. Um, and just, you know, it, it readdressed a lot of problems. That's always been me versus me and not what anxiety makes me feel that the world is after me. Things are happening to me instead of for me. Um, and yeah, so meditation has pretty much given me a fresh perspective and continues to do it every day. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think it's hard for a lot of leaders to be that vulnerable and that honest. I mean, you mentioned earlier, honesty is such an important trait for you and the brand, and you're, you're certainly showing that. Um, and you seem extremely self-aware, which is just like incredible, um, you, you mentioned that the first year, you know, everything was the first time and then year two, year three, you just wanted to constantly be better than that previous year. You know, some leaders find themselves filling another leader's, um, shoes where they already kind of inherit stakeholders and they inherit a history. You know, in your case, you're one of the leaders that has built something from nothing and that that something has become this powerful, incredible brand that all these other people feel like it's theirs too, right? Whether it's a customer or a fan or a partner or an employee, you know, there's all these people who feel ownership of this thing that you created. Um, and, and leaders always have a range of stakeholders, but I wonder if you could talk about who are some of the stakeholders that you have to make sure that you influence so that you can fulfill your mission and create the impact in the world that you want to make? Um, I mean, I think, you know, as a, in the self-funded company, you know, we, we don't have any real stakeholders, but I would say that, um, I think it's the younger me and the younger us and, I just hold 
that's my rule of thumb is like, as far as like, what is my duty here? And what are the, the, what is the space that I'm trying to fill? And I just think of the, the young, uh, my younger self and, I didn't have, as as a kid of immigrants from Honduras, Honduras has never been in this limelight of culture and fashion, music, like it's there, but there's no real representation of it. Um, And I think that lack of representation also, you know, impacted me with lack of imagination, lack of passion, lack of, you know, what are the possibilities of life? So I just I I think I, I I owe it to that kid that was lost and didn't have you know you know I had I, I thank my parents so much my siblings so much for doing their very best but you know when it came to being in a creative world you know my parents still don't understand what I do they have an idea of it but. They don't know anything, you know, they, they just know hard work and they know they they migrated here to give me a better life and they want the better life for them is stability. It's going to school, it's being a professional. Um, so it was hard when I when I, I did go to school to do that, I graduated, I have a bachelor's in social work, but I was like, I don't know if I can be in this office right now. Yep. And You know, I I think there's my story. What I say, my story is our story. And there's a lot of similarities in in my story with a lot of other people, especially the youth. And um, and then, you know, Wella, my partner in crime, my co-founder, he enabled me, He put the battery in my back and he said, I believe in you. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like I, I just go to him and say, are you with this or not? And he's the, you know, there's no me without him and he'll tell you the same. Um, but yeah, not sure about that answer the question either. <laughs> it did because, well, you know, you talked a lot about community being so important, building community and serving the community. And it, it sounds like you see that younger version of yourself in the community. And maybe that's one of the the, the reasons that, you know, that, that's a, that's a good point. I, I I feel like I represent a community that I'm in. I am the community. The yeah. community I am part of this. Um, we we're all together in this. So I would say that's a good point because I owe it to the community too. And you know, I I I represent something that I am as well. You know, I'm not. I, that's, we are a reflection of our community yeah. uh, and we're inspired by them. And, you know, it's, it's so rewarding to get that level of support and love from the community, from our community. And it's like, we, you know, this the, it's, it's the driving force to keep going. And you're a role model in that community, but also beyond, right? For people who aren't kids of immigrants, lowercase, but who see you as a leader and see the brand that you've built. Yeah. Um, I think I think the 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 this day and age that we're living in is changing so much. And I think I want to say I believe in the youth. I believe in the next generation. I know as much as fucked up shit that's going on in this world, I I believe in the good of it too. And I think I, I feel that we are a part of that and we are intentional and purposeful that way. And I feel that um yeah, like there there's a I, I'm the fact that I'm a role model or that people look at me as, as inspiring. And all I'm saying is I'm looking at you. And I'm just I'm I'm doing this for you, and I, I think, you know, it, it's it's I, I think the level of I always I don't want to get too deep. I know we got, we got limited time, but I always think of leaders, and you know, I'm not judging anyone, but I, when I think of leaders, and I don't hear words like love, 
and unity and these like values that are so important. Like I barely hear leaders talk about love. And it's like, you know, this these people that you're leading is not just another number on the board. This is not just another, this isn't, these are actual people. So when we're talking about leading, if we're not, if we're not talking about love, then I don't know what we're doing. Hmm. So again, not judging any other leaders, but I think is needs to be spoken about more and it needs to be spoken out loud. Because I think we all have it, it within us. I know everyone, love is what keeps us all going. Yeah. But I think that's something that we do a lot of. And, you know, we talk about it. And when you see us in person, you come to our events or whatever it is, and you come across anyone that's in our team, you know, th- that's what you're going to feel. And, you know, we started Love Day eight, seven years ago because of that in L.A., Pro, you know, the proclamation this year, I love day being a holiday. And, and you know, uh, just even thinking of prepping before those days, before love day. And it's like, I know we got a lot of work. I know everyone's exhausted, but just remember, we got to show up as love. Well, and you say you want more leaders to talk about love. And because you started love day as your kind of annual celebration, you have these corporations that have joined on in there. They're helping to make it possible, right? So you, you are getting more leaders to talk about love and to be part of that. Yeah. Uh, I, lastly, I just want to ask you, you know, you said to me before, you don't really see yourself as the most up-to-date person in, in fashion. Uh, chief influencers often tell us they don't get the most inspiration from their direct industry peers, but they get inspiration from other places and other spaces. I wonder if you could share where are some of the places outside of your own industry that that you have found inspiration to build and grow kids of immigrants? Um I think I, I a lot of my inspirations because of what I'm driven by is is based on just other creatives. Um, but but specifically other creators that use their platform for more than just their art. And their art is more than a song that they write or a painting that they do or, you know, a book that they write. Um, I'm inspired by those creatives that made it so much bigger than them. And, um, and you know, I think if I think of fashion, I, I think of Virgil. Um, you know, I think even that to see the impact not that he had in fashion but the p- impact he had in others was like wow um i you know one recently uh the co-founder of born and raised a la based brand uh passed away about 2 months 2 3 months ago it wasn't a close friend um we knew we knew each other but again, he passed and I just thought like, it's not even about the brand. Yeah, cool brand is amazing. But the impact he had in people is just, and just the, the how he empowered people. And then, and then I just go back to like, I think of this just era of the, of the Muhammad Ali's, of the Nina Simone's, of the James Balding, of, you know, the Marvin Gaye. I think of these musicians the Maya Angelos of people who like were super talented artists and and took their took their art to be a platform for the betterment of their community and their people and i think that to me you know that that the way that makes me feel and the way that empowers me is always my inspiration oh, i love that you know it's um it's it's pretty amazing to hear your story. And for those who maybe weren't already familiar with the brand Kids of Immigrants, I'm sure that they understand now the the purpose driven um, element of who you are, the the love and the community that you represent, and why um, the brand has inspired so many people. And everybody seems to want to work with you all, and why you've become a role model beyond your community to so many others. So 
Daniel, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, tons of great lessons that you shared. We really are grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of who I am. Sometimes I forget. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of Chief Influencer, a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board. If you know a leader who should be featured as a Chief Influencer, please nominate them at chiefinfluencer.org. For show notes and more, visit us at chiefinfluencer.org or follow Chief Influencer on LinkedIn. Until next time. 